Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Christine Despigna, author of Founding Modern, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's Lost Hero. Now this presentation is brought to you by the Real American Revolution public television series and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So Christian, let's get things underway by introducing our guest. Okay, thanks Randy. Mary Beth Norton is an American historian specializing in American colonial history and well known for her work on women's history and the Salem witch trials. Graduating from Harvard University and the University of Michigan, she is the Mary Donlan Alger Professor of American History at the Department of History at Cornell University. Norton served as president of the American Historical Association in 2018. She is a recipient of the Ambassador Book Award in American Studies for In the Devil's Snare, the Salem Witch, the Salem Witch Tri the Salem Witchcraft Crisis of 1692. Today we'll be talking with her about her most recent book, 1774, The Long Year of Revolution. Mary Beth, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. We're, we're delighted to have you. And let's just start off with something general. Uh, why did you decide to write a book just focused on 1774? Well, the idea goes back to my doctoral dissertation long ago when I was working on it at Harvard. Uh, it was on the loyalist exiles who left America and went to England. Uh, during the American Revolution. And I realized while reading about them and reading about the situations that they encountered in America, which left, led them to leave, that 1774 was, to my mind, the really crucial year. It was a year when people made decisions about their loyalties. Um, in 1773, I think it's fair to say that every colonial American regarded himself or herself that is white colonial Americans, regarded them as uh, themselves as um, subjects of King George III, loyal subjects of the empire. And it was the events of the year 1774 that divided the population into different groups. Um, of course, the most prominent groups are the group that decided that revolution was needed and the group that decided to remain loyal to the crown. And I say not become loyal, but remain loyal because that's what they did. They remained loyal when other people changed their minds. So, um, and indeed I discovered in the course of working on this book rather than the previous work that in fact the word loyalist was invented in the year 1774. And it was invented by a loyalist. That is, he's the first person that I know to use it. And he referred it to, used it to refer to himself and his friends. And you don't have a word like loyalist that is meaningful until you have people who are disloyal or are perceived as disloyal. Interesting. Well, wow. well, Mary Beth, I've got two questions, a two-part question, really. Why did the uh, East India Company tea become so important politically? And why did the tea basically persist as an issue long after the Tea Party initially in Boston? Um, the East India Company tea became uh, important politically when Parliament adopted the Tea Act, which was to save the East India Company from bankruptcy. And so it changed the way in which East India Company tea had been sold in the colonies. Up to that point, the law said that East India Company tea had to be sold at auction in London to individual importers um, who would then send the tea over to North America. But because uh, this was a very cumbersome process and did not, like the, did not let the EIC company control the sailing price in America, um, the Tea Act of, 17, of the spring of 1773 was designed to save the company from bankruptcy, which it was facing. And it was facing that because of rampant smuggling in the colonies plus mismanagement of the company. So what the, what the um, Tea Act did was to lower the price that colonists would have to pay for East India Company tea. The idea was to make it price competitive to smuggled tea. Um, this roused great furor in the colonies, not because of the amount of the tax, but because of the symbolism of it. Because what it meant was that colonists who had been literally drinking smuggled tea for, for years now would be able to drink legal tea for about the same price and pay the tax. <laughs> and so people didn't want to pay the tax. It was the symbolism of paying the tax. Um, it was the symbolism of um, people saying, um, uh, 
the, they didn't want parliament to be able to tax them. And so uh, by not paying the tax, of course, you're, you're, you are um, d denying parliament the right to tax you. So that was an issue. But the reason that it remained in, in incredibly important throughout the year 1774 was that although we today think that everybody in the colonies said hooray Boston when they destroyed the tea, that is not in fact the truth. Most other colonies were very upset and other major American figures like George Washington thought the Bostonians should not have destroyed the tea. And so it remained an issue what would be done about the destruction of the tea and whether the East India Company should be reimbursed for it remained a major problem politically until the First Continental Congress in the fall of 1774, when the Congress finally decided, no, we will not reimburse the East India Company for the destroyed tea. Mm -hmm. um, so it became, it was a constant issue throughout the year 1774. And uh, people who have read my book already comment that that's one of the things that surprises them the most about what they learned from the book, that tea remained such a problem all the way through the year. I'm so delighted you brought up smuggling <laughs> because what are, common, what are some of the common misconceptions that Americans today have about the tea and its aftermath? Well, one of the, one of the real uh, misconceptions is, of course, well, I just addressed it, which is the idea that Americans in protesting the tea were protesting higher taxes. They were protesting lower taxes. I mean, it seems totally mm -hmm. counterintuitive. But the issue was the symbolism of the tea tax, not the amount of the tea tax. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, today we tend to think that people who threw the tea into Boston Harbor were protesting higher taxes, but they were not. They were testing. They were protesting the tax itself. Sure. Right. You know, Mary Beth, I wanted to ask you about Dr. Joseph Warren. These the Suffolk Resolves. To me, this was a pivotal moment. Why do you think they were important? Well, one of the things that happened, of course, I think it became it was important for two reasons. One, the Suffolk resolves were the most militant of all the resolves that were adopted by county uh, committees or, or conventions, actually, that were established in Massachusetts uh, in, the, in the fall of 1774. We have to, in, the, in the August, August and September of 1774, what we have to understand is that the colony of Massachusetts was controlled and dominated by the British at this point um, through General Gage and the occupation of Boston. Um, so there was no ability of the colonial legislature at this point to um, oppose what was going on. So the counties formed conventions of their own. And Suffolk County, um, like many other counties, not only formed this convention, but the convention then adopted a series of resolves that were, if you look at them and you compare them to the resolves done by the other counties, they were much more militant and um, wide ranging than the other ones. Um, so what happened was, and what made the Suffolk resolves especially important in addition to their militants, um, and I might add which their militants was enforced by the typefaces that they used to print them. Um, uh, they were very dramatic typefaces in the broadsides that announced the contents of the Suffolk resolves. The Suffolk resolves were carried down to Philadelphia to the First Continental Congress meeting by Paul Revere, and the um, and the con the Continental Congress in debates that are very poorly um, recorded, alas, decided to um, support the Suffolk resolves. Now, what's interesting, and then that became a a, a, um, a moment where other people outside said, oh my gosh, the Continental Congress, which we thought was going to be a conciliatory body, in fact, has adopted and supported this very militant statement from Massachusetts. That means we had a completely uh, wrong conception of what the Congress was going to do. Um, but what's interesting to me, Had a, I think we she froze up there. I did, yeah. Now we could try and pick it up. Oh. And she's gone. Okay. Hmm. I don't know. First time that's ever happened. Yeah, I'll send her a quick email. I it. I, the connection disappeared and now it's back. Now you're back. Okay. okay. All right. Well, let's I don't go know ahead. Where it was exactly when it disappeared. Um, 
but I'll say, I'll, I'll go back to the idea that the, uh, the Continental Congress itself clearly did not think of the Suffolk Resolves the way the outside world thought of the Suffolk Resolves. And that's clear in um, a pamphlet written by a congressman later. Um, and he said, um, we did not intend to really uh, endorse the entire contents of the Suffolk Resolves. What we were endorsing was a, um, was a moderate uh, response in Boston to what was going on, or a moderate response in, in Massachusetts to what was going on. So I think the Suffolk Resolves, when they were adopted by the Continental Congress, were misinterpreted by people outside mm -hmm. as to what the Congress meant. Because the Congress was really intending to be um, conciliatory at that point. It was not deciding for great militants. Mm -hmm. right. Well, Dr. Warren really uh, focused on those resolves in response to the coercive acts. What exactly were the coercive or intolerable acts? Um, the coercive acts, there were, well, what I discovered is that historians usually list four different coercive acts. Um, the Boston Port Act, which is the one that closed the Port of Boston and everybody, until, until the tea was paid for, everybody was against that. Then there were two other acts. Um, the administration of, uh, I'm sorry, I'll start with the Massachusetts Government Act, which changed the Charter of Massachusetts to um, just uh, change the way the government was organized in certain ways. There were people in the colonies who supported the Massachusetts Government Act. They said that all it did was to regularize the government of Massachusetts and make it look like the, uh, the government of other colonies. But the colonial officials in other colonies, that is elected officials, um, rejected the Massachusetts uh, Government Act because it meant that Parliament was able to change the Charter of Massachusetts without checking with any, you know, without local approval. But the act, the coercive act that I realized in the course of working on the book was the one that aroused everyone's ire, and I mean everyone's, including future loyalists, was what's called the Administration of Justice Act. And what that provided was that a colonial an official or military officer who had been accused of killing a colonist could be tried in England rather than in America. And the quickest way to think about that is that it would have moved the Boston Massacre part trial from Boston to London. Mm -hmm. And people were furious about that. And they wrote, lo they wrote long uh, disquisitions about how terrible that act was. Nobody defended it. I never found a loyalist defender of the Administration of Justice Act. They tended to just ignore it. They didn't even talk about it. The colonists called it the Murder Act. And to me, that was really crucial. Um, that was the one that involved the grassroots of colonists outside of Massachusetts in opposition to Britain. Um, because the Massachusetts Government Act angered the leaders of the colonies, that is the elected, the local elected leaders of the colonies. But I think normal citizens didn't worry about that too much. But the Murder Act meant something to all of them. It meant that they could be killed by a colonial official or by a uh, military officer, and that person would not be tried for that crime in the colonies, and they would be tried in England. Also for rape or any other major offense, people did talk about that a lot, but they called it the Murder Act. And I came to believe that that was the crucial one. And indeed, there were several people who said that in their letters at the time, that this, this act is the crucial one. It's far worse than anything else. Interesting. Well, Mary Beth, why do you think it's important to study all of the colonies in 1774, not just, not just Massachusetts? Well, why? in effect, I've just answered it in my discussion of the Murder Act, because what that act was, it was something that brought everybody together. Um, and we, of course, we have to understand, although the res when people talk about the origins of the revolution, we tend to talk mostly about Massachusetts. But in fact, everybody had to be involved. It could not, the revolution could not have gone anywhere if it was only Massachusetts. You had to have all the colonies or most of the colonies uh, because Georgia never sent a representative to the Continental Congress, the first or the second Continental Congress in the beginning. Um, so that they had to have everybody in alignment and what made them put them into alignment with each other was their reactions to these coercive measures, these very heavy handed laws that Parliament was adopting um, to coerce, try to coerce the colonies into doing what they wanted. Interesting. Yeah, you know, and I've always kind of felt that 73 
has been popularized because of the Tea Party. 75 obviously has all the drama of Lex and Concord and Bunker Hill. And, and 1774, I don't want to say it's a neglected year, but it, it really hasn't received the attention of 73 and 75. But what do you think is the major takeaway from your book, 1774? And, and, and to follow up on that, what is the one thing that you would like readers to take away? Well, the one thing I'd like readers to take away from it is the importance of 1774, because I, too, thought that everybody had skipped over 1774. Um, in fact, if you look at general histories of the coming of the revolution, even really, really good ones, they don't pay much attention to what happens in 1774. They skip right from the Boston Tea Party to the First Continental Congress. And there are months of developments of political consensus building, I would say, that occur between the, those, those periods. And what, I, what people, I want people to take away from the book is how important was the exchange of ideas that occurred in, um, in the newspapers, in correspondence, throughout that year, and in meetings, in popular meetings that were held throughout the colonies, in, in cities, in towns, in southern counties. Um, one of the things I looked at was the records of 28 different Virginia counties uh, meetings in the summer of 1774. And that's where the consensus is built that um, we must resist the British unless they change their policies. And then of course the British showed an unwillingness to change their policies, which led everyone to align behind the revolution. But it's not in fact, um, obvious at the beginning of 1774 that that's what's going to happen because in fact there was so much um, criticism of Boston for what happened in the Tea Party. Um, so it gives, so I think my book gives people a sense that um, what happened in Lexington and Concord in April of 1775 is not inevitable. If things had gone a different way in the year 1774, the outcome could have been very different. So I wanted people to understand that um, that I don't I didn't want to take a teleological view of the revolution. I didn't want to make everybody think that once the tea went into the harbor, that was the end of the story because right. it wasn't because it took a long time for people to agree about what to do. Lots of exchanges of ideas um, uh, and lots and lots of disagreement. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is the many different disagreements that Americans had, not just loyalists versus radicals, but people of different varieties of moderation or radical belief or something like that. Fascinating. Well, Christine and Mary Beth, it looks like that's all the time we have today for the interview. And we've been interviewing Mary Beth Norton, author of 1774, The Long Year of Revolution. Mary Beth, thanks so much for joining us. I, I just, you know, I, I hope the book has a long shelf life. It's packed with information and anyone with a vague interest in the revolution. And I think scholars, historians needs to read this book. So uh, we hope you'll come back and talk to us more. And for the viewers, we hope you've enjoyed another edition of the Dr. Joseph Warren Society interviews with prominent authors and historians. And on behalf of Randy Flood and myself, Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. And thanks so much, Mary Beth. We really I very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. It's really thanks been so a much. privilege. Thank you. Thanks so much.